thank you very much, Stephen. And I know Stephen says that I've done a lot with Kubernetes community, but I would say he's done equally as good for the community. And he never says that out loud, but I would like to call this out and say, thank you very much, Stephen, for doing the great job that you've always done. Um, um, and I'm just not, it's not just flattering you at the moment. I'm being very honest about it. <clears throat> Coming to the topic, and I think uh, the, the talk before this was absolutely brilliant, although some of the things that I'm going to talk about it were also covered in that talk. But I'll try to see if I can spin a lens of, you know, um, actually what I've done in this uh, last many years of using Kubernetes in production. <clears throat> and um, see if I can at least give you one or two t key takeaways to, you know, what you can do with your cluster or what you can think about. Or maybe I can help that, you know, uh, food for thought ideas for you all. So with that in mind, <clears throat> what we are going to talk about today is potentially the things that I've experienced over the past few years uh, of running Kubernetes in production. And by the way, I'm, I'm Pratik, I'm one of the, uh, I am the chief technology officer at Enabler. Um, Enabler is one of the, if this moves. Yeah, Enabler is one of the <clears throat> Melbourne-based consultancy. Uh, we specialize in uh, DevOps, infrastructure, help companies with digital transformation and all of the goodness that is uh, DevOps today. Um, and most notably, I've been working with Kubernetes and I do help clients understand the ecosystem and simplify it for them to a degree. Now, I wouldn't go much in the details of why Kubernetes, because I think Adrian did a very, very wonderful job of this. Uh, but one of the things that I would like to highlight is if you think about what Kubernetes is, I know it is it is required because, you know, modern architecture, you need, there's a lot of containers, you need to manage them. But if you think about what Kubernetes is um, and what it does, it's, it's not just your regular container orchestration framework, if you will. Um, it's 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 pretty much these days a a framework uh, on top of which you build um, uh, platforms on top of which you craft abstractions so that you know your developers or your uh, people who are writing features in your uh, in your company or building out something value for your customers can easily release into production. And I have seen in the past many years I've seen people building beautiful abstractions on top of Kubernetes and. For that, Kubernetes is very extensible, and that is why it is one of uh, the choice of container orchestration framework. So that is something that I wanted to highlight as well. Um, <clears throat> but with that, as I like, I don't know if you folks were around when we did this uh, security talk as well. Uh, something that I mentioned then was Kubernetes. Unfortunately, is not secure by default, and there are lots and lots of levers you can pull, and more, lots and lots of dials you can turn. Um, which just, you know, uh, gives you that good abstraction or a secure ecosystem to deploy your containers. And maybe we'll touch on some of this today. Um, so obviously with that problem statement in mind, obviously, you know, you need to think about a lot of things like how am I going to do logging? How am I going to do uh, monitoring, disaster recovery? What about my databases? What about how do I do blue green? There's a lot of capability that you can leverage um, in Kubernetes, but unfortunately I've seen over the past few years that it's just a matter of highlighting, okay, this exists in Kubernetes. Like scaling wise, you can do this in Kubernetes only if you think about X, Y, Z. And let's see if we can talk about those X, Y, Z today. Um, so probably starting off with, and the way we would structure this is we will talk about some high level buckets uh, operations being one of them, observability being one of them, scalability being another one, and last one being security. And we'll try to see um, if I, I can point you maybe in certain direction or provoke some thoughts in terms of uh, what I've, gained, I've learned over the past few years in those high level buckets. So first off is operations. Like uh, when you build out a Kubernetes cluster, it's, it's one thing to just have a cluster up and running, but it's completely different uh, thing to have it operationalized and running in production, servicing your application, taking the load, um, exposing your applications to public internet. And there is a lot that comes from uh, in, in operations perspective. Now, one of the first things I ever, ever talk to people when I talk about Kubernetes is uh, configuration management of your cluster. 
Now, configure, as soon as people hear configuration management, they go back to like, oh, you're talking about the puppets and the others. I'm like, no, maybe not. What I mean by configuration management is when you have a cluster up and running. So let's say, let's just imagine if you're on AWS and you stand up your beautiful EKS cluster, it's up and running. Uh, the API is ready to be deployed on. There is still a lot more that goes on top of that cluster, like things like your namespaces, things like your uh, role uh, bindings, your cluster roles, um, things like your uh, pod security policies, your network policies, all of this is your cluster state configuration. One of the first things I, have, I always recommend to people is make sure all of this is version controlled. And you'll be surprised. I've seen organization where things like RBAC or namespaces weren't version controlled and you have, you have so uh, uh, disjointed clusters like production might not be looking like non-prod. So one of the first things I do definitely advise people is to think about how can you version control your configuration. Now, um, as, as Adrian mentioned, GitOps is the new hotness these days and GitOps is like a brilliant way of at least managing your cluster uh, configuration today. And uh, some of the tools that I've mentioned there is Flux and or Argo CD. And what you can do is pretty much um, check in your configuration in that GitHub repository, deploy Flux on your cluster and point it to that repository. And at all times, it will try to make sure that it's pulling either the SHA or the branch um, that you pointed it at and keep your cluster's configuration in sync. Now it has kind of like a side benefit as well. Like if let's just say on your cluster, if people have manual access or they can do things um, from kubectl, you can pretty much guarantee that using some sort of a GitOpsy approach for configuration management, you can avoid that drift. Um, you can avoid that creep and you can force um, your operators, GitOps operators to make sure your cluster state is always consistent. Uh, the third one on that list is uh, something called Valero. And again, this is literally one of the things that have saved my life many, many times when, uh, when it comes to operating clusters in production. So I'll give you an anecdote. Once um, I was in an organization, I wouldn't name the organization, in an organization, I was doing a deployment um, uh, to a cluster in production. Um, and to no fault of mine, it was almost beer o'clock and I wanted to rush out of the door. Um, and I pushed, okay, just apply, apply, apply. Didn't actually notice um, that one of the commands that I executed from my terminal, I was actually pointing at a production cluster. Uh, whereas I was testing something in our development cluster and I actually took down the entire monitoring stack from there um, and a couple of other applications as well. So where Valero comes into the picture, Valero is, is a tool. It was initially called Arc and it was released by Heptio, um, but now it's, it's um, uh, what's the company, VMware. VMware owns this tool and what it does is it's constantly on a schedule, keeps on taking snapshots of your cluster, um, not just your resources, but can, it, can, it can also snapshot your volumes and store it in, let's say, uh, an S3 bucket or a storage bucket somewhere. And when you do something like that, like what I did, you can just go, oops, let's just restore from the backup or snapshot. Now, the caveat there is, um, it depends on how often you're backing up. Luckily for me, I was backing up every hour, so I had a good state to return to. But always, always think, think about these things. Like with, with disaster, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Things like this, these can happen and you might want to restore it. So my key takeaway on this is version control your configuration management so that you can config so that you can go to a known state always and make sure in some state, in some shape and form, you're backing up your configurations um, and the state of the cluster. Um, the next thing in operations perspective is isolation. Now this may sound a bit, bit vague as to how is this part of operations, but I'll tell you um, is what I mean by isolation is when you're operating a cluster at a scale, and again, it depends on how you've structured your cluster how you designed your cluster, um, like how you're servicing um, uh, your uh, teams. But if you've got a, a large cluster and you have got multiple applications running on it, make sure you leverage something called Kubernetes namespaces. Namespaces are a good way to isolate workloads running on your cluster. Because what namespace is, 
effectively it's it's kind of like a virtual cluster on your actual cluster so you can create that world view like you can provide people with that world view that that namespace is the cluster for them and a couple of benefits to that um you can apply things like resource quotas and um uh, limits and yep i see a comment about designated driver but yeah you can uh, maybe i'll switch off chat um, <laughs> where you can apply things like resource quotas and limits on those namespaces the benefit of that is if you have like a let's say a rogue application on your cluster if you don't have resource quotas or limits you may end up chewing down all the resources available to your cluster now there are some advanced features today that you can leverage like vertical pod auto scaling and things like that which we'll talk about in a bit but my recommendation is always think about your resource quotas and limits and if you don't have an idea as to um how much you need then maybe played by the er deployed to an environment test it out run some performance testing and then come up with those numbers um another aspect of having namespaces is you can you can actually build out an r back model as adrian said an r back model where you can restrict individual teams and developers to just that namespace that kind of gives you a cleaner separation um uh, between projects and you're not actually bleeding one project's resources to other projects people are not able to see uh things left right from center so definitely to if any take away from this slide use namespaces and think about uh rbac primary as like like first and foremost think about how you design your rbac um and think about resource quotas and limits now the last point on this slide is kind of around container sandboxing now when i said kubernetes is not secure by default there are a few other bits involved as well like container escape although a pretty theoretical vulnerability but there are certain cases where it has been exploited and people have taken advantage of container exploit so maybe if you uh, if you know it depends on your your mileage may vary but have a look at container sandboxing technologies like gvisor which can actually form a shim around your um uh, uh, to, to shim around your application and proxy all the kernel calls but the caveat there is using technologies like that you will incur a massive performance hit when i say massive it's in, to the order of 5 to 10% Uh, but it is still massive in certain cases if you're running critical applications like uh, let's say trading applications or health applications or whatever it may be impactful for you so analyze what is that impact for you and if it if it is not significant i would recommend looking into those technologies oh yep um the next one in terms of operations is this is more of my um suggestion and uh recommendation around how you automate toil or day to day like how do you codify your operational tasks like kubernetes operators or crd and controller um is is a absolute brilliant way of extending the kubernetes api to build better abstractions now what i mean by that is um and i'll give you an example um when i was at one of the organizations we built something called a db operator and the purpose for that was uh, you punch in a five line yaml and this operator will go and create an rds database on amazon for you and it will take all the credentials and inject it into the secrets in your namespace next to your application now if you take a step back and think about what that does is it it kind of provides that abstraction on database provisioning and it makes it very similar to what kubernetes yamls look to, look like so people don't have to go and learn oh should i do it by cloud formation now oh, wait hang on i should do with terraform or oh, where should i manage the state what should i do with this database what's my backup retention policies all of that was sorted in that operator and i'm not saying that you need to write a db operator or use that db operator but think about this it kubernetes is heavily extensible if you are running kubernetes if you are uh, operating kubernetes think about how you can extend it leveraging operators and how can how you can build better abstractions so that your teams don't have to or your developers don't have to go and learn other bits now um when i say it it's it's codifying operational tasks task, it can be used for many many things it could be used for 
Um, let's just say if you dynamically want to configure alerts in Alert Manager, that was another operator that I wrote previously, um, you can do that as well. Or maybe you want to react to certain events on the cluster. Maybe a volume gets created, you want to do something with it. The possibilities are endless. And if you take a step back and think about it, most of the extensions on Kubernetes ecosystem, like let's say Istio's or Valero itself, or any of those, these are pretty much your operators which extend the existing functionality on Kubernetes. So key takeaway from this slide, have a think about if you are really going into production and you seriously want to automate away the toil, have a think about Kubernetes operators and how they can fit um, in your pipeline, how you can automate away all the operational tasks. Um, this one is more of a philosophy kind of an, a thing that I, I like to talk to people about is, uh, have a when you're creating that cluster, think about uh, don't believe in uh, so again. Okay, let me take a step back. Like zero trust approach. What is zero trust? Um, when you're deploying applications or when you're building an ecosystem or an entire architecture, don't uh, put trust inherently because that application is deployed in a certain location or in a certain manner or in a certain domain. At each point check whether the request that is coming through is allowed to go forward or not. Is it allowed to enter into this application or not? You don't have to trust because an application is deployed somewhere or it is sitting behind a firewall. Just don't give it that trust. Have a zero trust approach. Um, and within your cluster, think about how you can, you know, um, leverage maybe mutual authentication across your applications because I will tell you what, like with, on, on Kubernetes, like if you just use Nginx, the traffic is pretty much unencrypted on the cluster. Maybe your security requirements or your requirements, maybe you need encrypted uh, traffic within the cluster. You can use MTLS and there are service meshes that will do these for you. Like Istio for one will absolutely do it for you. But in certain cases, you may not want a full blown service mesh because all you want is MTLS. Then how do you do it? Have a look at the ecosystem. Have a look at Envoy. Envoy literally is um, the most like suitable cloud native proxy solution available today, and it can do most of that functionality for you. Istio is a very good wrapper on top of configuring Envoy, but you may or may not want to go with Istio. It may depend on your mileage. Um, so think about those things. And also, um, if you are very uh, security concerned or if there are requirements, um, make think about ingress and egress choke points. So I'll give you an example. Like one of the one of the uh, clusters I was just uh, auditing or looking at. Um, every service had had an ingress point, and again, nothing wrong with that. Maybe that's how you want to operate. But then it is very hard to you know uh, put some inspections or put some gates or put some controls on each of those uh, ingress points. So what we did was for that uh, cluster stack, we uh, we moved to a single single ingress point, um, and we moved to I think Istio one point some version I don't remember what version, but yeah, we moved to Istio and it natively inherently offered so many controls um, that if we went out and built it for those individual ingress point, it would have been a nightmare to manage. So again, your mileage may vary, but think about these things don't trust anything that comes into your cluster just because it's in your cluster just question everything and how do you put authorization in front of each and every request um that would be my key takeaway from this slide um and generally speaking about operations i would say pipeline everything like don't manually do anything and this is again from experience because i have take <laughs> blown away clusters or stacks um, because, you know, manually kubectl, or I know kubectl, I will kubectl the hell out of this. Um, and it, it just takes k-delete po and then that pod is gone or that deployment is gone. So I would say pipeline everything, limit user access. If, if Once you've pipelined everything, uh, you don't need to provide your users access to admin or edit things on the cluster. You can take away or dial down on that permission spec and maybe make it more read only and because everything will go through pipeline. But once you do that, you need to think about your break glass scenario. I've had one <laughs> situation where we've locked down everything. Brilliant. 
our, our pipeline broke and there was an incident and we were not able to deliver a solution um, into the cluster. Now, it wasn't that bad because um, it wasn't like a, f- a public facing cluster or even a cluster in production. Uh, we were able to rectify it within half an hour. So think about that. Once you start locking this down, think about those exceptional scenarios where you would need to keep CTL. And you have you will. It's, it's, it's not a question of if again, it's a question of when. So plan ahead, plan about those things and make sure that you're ready when that is required. Um, native secrets management on Kubernetes, not secure, unfortunately. So think about if you, uh, what's your requirement. Um, I have seen many, many ways of solving this. Maybe if you are already using or plan to use Vault, go with Hashi Vault. Uh, maybe use seal secrets, which is from Bitnami, and then lock down the native secrets object because the way seal secret works is you create a seal secret object and then it will translate into the native secret object. So give permission to the seal secret object, but lock down the other one. So have a think about that. Native Kubernetes, native is not secure. How do you want to secure it? Uh, and lastly, if you're using Kubernetes dashboard, maybe my recommendation is there is good alternatives. If you're already on a cloud, like GKE does a very good dashboard as well. Um, but if you absolutely have to um, have a think about how you can, you know, uh, authenticate or provide an authentication layer on top, maybe use an OIDC connect proxy or something like that. Um, so overall, that was. Sorry, but can I just I stop it just for one sec? Just that we we have a few questions, and I'm just thinking like if we want to actually sort of get off to sleep at some point tonight, we need to ask you a couple of them. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. I might just uh, fire up our little poll just whilst uh, I'm digging around in the questions. If everybody can have a quick have a quick click, we're just interested to see who's out there in the audience. Yeah, so I'll 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 start. Uh, I'll read this one. So from Nang, uh, the question is: uh, Sorry if this is a silly question. I've just had I've just started learning Kubernetes. Are operators going to replace Helm charts? Oh, interesting, interesting question. But by the way, there's never a silly question. I'll be very, very honest. Kubernetes is such a vast ecosystem. It's such a such a massive ecosystem that there could never be a silly question. And I used to ask these initially as well. Um, to answer your question, are operators going to replace Helm charts? I don't, I don't think so necessarily because their functionalities is uh, are pretty much uh, different. Um, if I talk about Helm charts. Um, and Stephen, stop me whenever you want me to stop. But if I talk about Helm charts, they're more of a way to template your manifest, very roughly speaking. They're mostly used for templating your manifest, whereas operators are codifying your operational task, like uh, provisioning a database for you, like creating uh, your backups, scheduling your backups. So they're kind of two separate things, if you know what I mean. I'll pause there for a second, wait if Stephen... No, I was just going to say, if you, if you just want to, there are all the questions that are on the bottom there. I think Sajid was asking uh, a question. If we're talking about GitOps, uh, from like a backups perspective, do you recommend using something like Valero? Um, sorry. Where is it if you're using GitOps, do you need Valero? Um, interesting question. Yes, uh, I think it depends is my, <laughs> and sorry for being a consultant, but it kind of depends. So. Think about GitOps. GitOps, generally, what you want to do is have your configuration there or or the cluster configuration in your GitOps repository, right? Um, Generally, your cluster is just way more than that. It will have your uh, um, secrets objects, which are created by application teams. And maybe there are these are two layers that you need to think about. One is your cluster configuration, and the another one on top is actually your app deployments and their assets that are required to go along with it. Now, I have had a few questions in the past as well. Why would you not GitOps your deployments and services as well? It gets into a very tricky situation if you start doing that, but let's just assume you're not doing that and you have your configuration in GitOps and your deployments and services are going on top from an application perspective. Now. That application can have state as well. Like it might have a PV, a PVC, uh, where it's writing something to the disk, and you might want to back that whole thing up. You might want to just back up a a namespace saying, this is the snapshot of my namespace every hour. So they're kind of different purposes, whereas GitOps will make sure that your configuration uh, 
or whatever you've got in that repository is consistently applied. Valero, you can be selective about this is how I want to snapshot or backup anything. Cool. Excellent. Uh, we'll just we'll see if there's another just another one or two questions here, and then we'll go straight back in again. So no such thing as silly questions. Uh, what we got? So there's uh, Mohammed Karimov. What tools are a good fit along with K8 uh, for Canary deployments? Is Flux sufficient? Interesting one. Very interesting one. So uh, in my experience, I've, I've leveraged Istio a lot for Canary because one of the things that you need to do. Um, uh, with with uh, while you're doing a canary, you need to do that kind of traffic split. Now, yes, there are really really complicated and complex ways um, you can do that with the native ingress objects as well. But it just becomes very complicated when you start doing with the native objects. Um, so I would recommend if you are at that level, next level of uh, you know uh, Kubernetes, uh, and you're thinking about these higher order problems like canaries and other thing. Have a look at one of the service meshes because most of the service meshes will provide you this advanced net or traffic management capability. Whereas like in Istio, it's easy. You just create a subset in the service and start doing the traffic splitting uh, between your various deployments. Or you can take a dial it all the way up and can do it at a very dns -y layer as well. But that would need more scripting as well. Probably might have confused you, but. So you've got one. One last question, then I promise I'll pass back. Yep. <laughs> um, how do you manage flux with multiple clusters and some pipelines to release? How do you manage flux with multiple clusters and pipelines to release? Oh, interesting. So let me see if I interpret the question correct. So this is more around in, maybe let's take it a step back. And in, in the GitOps way, how do you manage multiple cluster configuration? Would that be a right summation of the question? Probably I'll say yes and I'll answer anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, with GitOps, um, it's very interesting because you 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 lose that control from outside. Like you, you're not applying from outside and then validating and then progressing to the next environment where it's kind of like inverted, where you're pulling a branch and just applying it. So one of the ways I have looked at it or I've had a chat with few people to uh, look at it is um, I, you can adopt one or two models. Either you can do individual repository for each of the clusters, which may sound very bad, but if you have enough automation where from one repository to the other, you can start pushing codes or creating pull requests, it may work. It depends on how, how advanced your tooling would be. Or the other way could be within one repository, you can have dedicated branches for your environments. And from one branch to the other, you can automate the creation of pull requests or you, know, you merge into these branches. Like it depends on how mature your Git or your tooling at that layer is. Um, and probably I would say having individual repositories will be better, but then it requires mature tooling around it. Okay, I probably interrupted you far too much. <laughs> I shall pass the microphone back to you and get off this stage, Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> Not all good, all good. Um, Sorry, what was it? Yeah, okay. So, um, so as we said uh, initially, uh, operations was the first bucket. Second bucket is observability. Now, I won't, I won't bang on much about observability because it's a very common topic. But I would like to touch on a few uh, at, at at a very high level, the pillars of observability, if you will. So, in terms of observability, when you have a cluster in production, you need to make sure you need to just take a step back and think about what will I do if I don't have QCTL access at all. How will I know what's happening in my cluster? How will I make sure that services are operating in my cluster? So this is the lens. Take that lens when you're trying to build out observability for your cluster in production, because you don't, I'll tell you, kubectl will not scale once you start going beyond one cluster, two cluster, or DR, or high availability, uh, or resilience design for your clusters. So with the... With that in mind, so talking about monitoring, think about uh, how you will monitor assets in your cluster. One of the most common way and the open source tool of choice here is Prometheus, right? And you deploy Prometheus with the metric server and voila, you have a lot of information going into the Prometheus server. What I have advised or I've seen 
and I've done with multiple teams is uh, don't just rely on Prometheus, uh, uh, what Prometheus can scrape like a CPU and memory. Uh, look at creating custom metrics for your application because at the end of the day, what matters about your application is how uh, its behavior, right? If its behavior is to sell credit cards and if it is not selling credit cards, you need to know about that. Why would you even care about CPU and memory utilization? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But what I need to say is create custom, custom metrics around your application's behavior or what your purpose of your application is. And then use those to chart out how your application, is it healthy or not healthy? Um, with Prometheus, uh, one of the problems that I have seen in the past as well, Prometheus is not resilient in itself. And it's, it's generally not very available. Like you just run one Prometheus server, shoot it in the head. It will have a stateful set come back, but it, it's not very resilient. And when this breaks is if you have multiple clusters, let's say if you're running in active active fashion, or you've got two or three different clusters, how would you have a single pane of glass view of your metrics? So some of the open source tooling that I have seen or I've used in the past is things like Thanos. Um, Thanos kind of gives you that single, it runs kind of like a query sidecar and backs it up in buckets. Um, there's a lot that Thanos can do, have a look at it. Um, and another one is Cortex, which I've heard uh, mostly about uh, being used with Prometheus. But if you want to leverage any of these, uh, think about using Prometheus operator. Now, this is the new um, uh, goodness that the entire Kubernetes ecosystem is moving to. Everything is getting deployed via operators. And maybe now I understand where that question was coming from. But yeah, everything is moving towards operators. And Prometheus also has an operator for deploying. And Thanos and some of these integrations are, you can natively just uh, configure using a few flags and the others. Um, within cloud providers, generally, there are some tool, uh, tools that can take your Prometheus metrics and shove it in a uh, permanent storage. Like, for instance, on GKE or on Google, uh, there's a thing called Prometheus to Stack Driver, which you can run uh, on your cluster, and it will take keep on ingesting your Prometheus metrics into Stack Driver. So you, ne you don't necessarily need your Prometheus to be uh, very resilient in that case. Um, in terms of monitoring, as Adrian said before as well, look at some of the SaaS toolings if you can. If you know you have the uh, capacity or you know budgets and all of that, things like um, New Relic, Datadog, SysDig um, are really good at giving you that monitoring view. Um, and it's it's kind of you're monitoring the cluster from outside, whereas your Prometheus is on the cluster. So who monitors the monitor? again becomes a challenge. Um, so have a look at those and key takeaways, just you know, think about your application first and foremost, the purpose of your application, the behavior of application, uh, make sure you are monitoring that as well. Um, some of the commands that I've listed at the bottom, kget events, it has really helped me a lot. Generally, when things go wrong on the cluster, these are some of the things that I start looking into, uh, ktop nodes, ktop pods, looking at what's the consumption, what's happening, and then events in general. Um, the next pillar of observability, again, is logging. Very, very important from cluster perspective. If you are not using a managed Kubernetes offering, you will need to ship your logs to a central log aggregation place somewhere. Make sure you're doing that because it's, it's the rich information in logs that can sometimes help you diagnose the situation. Um, with many managed offerings, there are native integrations with Fluentd and Fluent Bits. Um, now, the key takeaway I would say from this slide would be when you're shipping off your logs into an aggregation system, make sure you think about indexing or you make sure you think about how you're going to categorize those logs. So what I mean by that is if you've got 10 applications on the cluster, one way could be just take all of their logs and shove it into one index on Splunk or maybe in one category in Sumo Logic. Other, other strategy could be you section off, you, 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 you create a different index for each application. The implications of that is you can then access control on the other end. But have a think about this before you go into production because it, it becomes cumbersome to change it afterwards as well. Not saying you can't, you can easily, but it just becomes uh, cumbersome. Now, really, really important, capture your API event logs and audit logs. Like if you're managing your own Kubernetes cluster, make sure those logs are going into your log aggregation system. 
in an index where you're looking at it or have some sort of dashboarding or alerting. Now, the reason I say it is important is because, um, let's say, if you have an RBAC policy that X can't access this resource or can't access secrets, and if somebody is trying to abuse that policy or any other policy for that matter, you will have those logs. You need to make sure that those logs are captured for you to diagnose an issue later. If something breaks in your cluster or something happens to your cluster, you need to be able to trace it down to how did this happen. Like one of the examples is uh, when, when I initially, like very early in the days, started using network policies, I wouldn't even know why the what two apps wouldn't talk to each other. And if you start looking at your uh, audit logs or event logs, it will tell you you're getting a 401 unauthorized. And it was mostly because of those network policies. So it may help you, but absolutely capture it if you don't want to, I mean, it may or may not help you in diagnosis, but it will definitely help you in security events. Uh, and at the very bottom, I've mentioned a utility called Stern. So Stern is a command line utility. Oh, it's just wonderful and you, so useful. Like if you're if you're logged into a cluster and if you want to look at the logs of a pod, you generally go K logs, pod ID, and it will give you those logs. And you need to give it a very, like the full blown pod ID, whereas Stern, you just go Stern X, and if X is in any of the names, it will give you start giving you all the logs for it. And it's just like very useful. You don't have to actually copy and paste IDs. When you get into production, these utilities are really, really helpful and they're lifesaver. They're like, oh, wow, really simplifies your workflow. So key takeaway on this, think about your indexing and do capture your audit logs and API event logs. Um, tracing, this is more of a, because it's a pillar, one of the pillars of observability, observability, so I thought I'll mention. But tracing, think of tracing more required for your application end-to-end -end, um, um, request tracing. This is really helpful when you're looking at, so let's say if, if you have an application running on your cluster, uh, which is you know de degraded or not performing or not available, tracing will actually help you pinpoint where the problem is. As in, if, if the call flow is hopping through, let's say six or seven apps, and then going off somewhere else. In that six or seven hops, you can actually pinpoint, okay, this is the application that is causing a problem, and then you can go into details in logs and things like that. Um, Jaeger is an open source tool you can use, and if you are on GKE, um, a stack driver tracing gives you that beautiful correlation. X-ray, you can also integrate Amazon X-ray if you're on Amazon. Uh, but if you are already using a SaaS tool like New Relic or maybe Sysdig or maybe Datadog, they will have these capabilities in build. Like, so you just run one tool and you get so much out of the box, but there's a price to pay to that. Um, final one in observability is there's a lot, lot of open source um, uh, dashboard. There are lots and lots of open source dashboard available today. Uh, even if you go to Grafana and search for Grafana dashboards, you'll find uh, people have built such rich dashboards. And I think uh, Adrian showed one on his screen as well. Make sure you're leveraging them. If you're using Istio as a service mesh, make sure your dashboards are in there. Um, and key takeaway is if you are creating lots and lots of alert, be very, take alerts very seriously. Don't just create alerts for the sake of it because alert fatigue is real and minimize the number of alerts you can. Like don't just alert if a pod is restarting. Maybe it's restarting, it's functioning. Alert if the functionality is not available or that behavior is not available. But yeah, key takeaway, lots of open source things available. Have a look at you know uh, how you can optimize your alerting and not create that alert fatigue. Sorry, I'm a bit, I'm rushing, I'm conscious of time as well. So let's... Talk about this. Oh, okay, this is the important bucket. Like, I love this uh, scalability aspect of Kubernetes because this is the whole promise, right? Like, you bring your container deployed on the cluster, it will run forever and it will scale and everything. Yeah, it's it's not as easy as that though. So, one of the things um, in the past I've seen is people deploy it to Kubernetes and they start saying, "Hey, why is it not scaling?" because you have to deploy certain other assets. So you need to make sure Kubernetes understands how to scale your application. So native object, horizontal pod auto scalers, they can scale based on CPU utilization or memory utilization. But if you are creating custom metrics today, you can also configure it to scale on custom metrics. 
And it's pretty, pretty simple, right? Like HPA will keep on monitoring your metrics endpoint for those metrics. And if it is CPU and, or memory, it will scale based on the utilization. But if it is a custom metric, it will scale based on that static number that you return and what you've configured in HPA. And pretty in fact, like pretty much what it does is as you can see on the image, it will go to your deployment and say, hey, you asked me to scale when X, Y, Z happened. Now just add X number of pods, which you asked me to in HPA. Now it might sound very simple, but this is the key to making sure that your application can scale. And as I said earlier in the monitoring section as well, just don't rely on CPUs and memories, create those custom metrics because Kubernetes offers this to you today. Create those custom metrics and make sure you've got the metric server running and scale on those custom metrics because that is where your business value is, right? Um, another one is cluster autoscaler. Now cluster autoscaler mostly available for your cloud-based deployments of Kubernetes. Um, GC, AWS, AKS, um, and then their managed versions as well, you can deploy cluster autoscaler. But pretty much what it does is uh, it will scale up or scale down your infrastructure based on utilization or insufficient resources. Um, the, the, the lesson that, or the key takeaway that I would say is it's, it's where this thing, like now I think cluster autoscaler is pretty stable these days, but it used to be very gnarly and it's very, in important to look at um, the a scaling logs or scaling event logs. So make sure you're taking all of these logs into your log aggregation system. Um, and with cluster autoscaler, generally it creates a config map in the Kubernetes system namespace. Specific, and like if, you, like if you're running a managed Kubernetes offering, you wouldn't have the cluster autoscaler pod, but you can still look at that config map and look at the status of it. Um, one of the caveats with cluster autoscaler I've seen in the past, and I think it's now pretty much fixed, but what I've seen is if you create some pods in kubesys, if you create a deployment or daemon set in kube system namespace, um, specifically daemon set, and cluster autoscaler seems to think like that's an important pod and it will not evict that pod very easily. And if it is not able to evict a pod, it will not scale down your cluster. So in the past, I've seen situations where your cluster will scale up and then a daemon set gets deployed and it will never shrink back down. And you're just paying for resources for no good reason. So make sure you uh, test and verify scale up, scale down. And if there is a need for you to deploy something in Kube system, uh, make sure you investigate pod disruption budgets, which will tell the autoscaler, yep, it's okay to move this uh, pod. Yeah, so key takeaway, look at cluster autoscaler if you are using any of the publicly available clouds, it definitely, definitely will save you a lot of um, hassles. Um, this is the vertical pod autoscaler is a new one and I, I really like the concept of it as well. So remember how I said when we were talking about isolation that you need to configure resource limits and quotas and requests and all of that. Vertical pod autoscaler kind of reduces the need of doing that or takes away the need of doing that. Um, if you have VPA enabled in your cluster, you can run it in an observed mode. Uh, I think it's called off mode, if I'm not mistaken. And what it will do is it will give you recommendations. So if you're running a big fat Java app, you can have VPA deployed and it will tell you, these are your recommended uh, uses or you know, request and memory. Um, and and it, it, it just removes that need for you to pre, like understand previously, like be before even deploying, you don't even have to think about resource and limits, just deploy it into a uh, like non-production based cluster, run VPA, look at the recommendation and then maybe create those recommendations, there are other modes as well where VPA can auto scale your pod up, um, which is really, really interesting way of looking at resources and limits. The main goal with VPA is to provide better utilization of your cluster. So I would heavily recommend looking at VPA if you are already going into production. Um, and last but not the least, generally um, in terms of scale, think about segmentation of your clusters. What I mean by that is it may not directly tie in with scalability, but I've seen in the past people segment their cluster based on number of nodes, saying we'll create clusters of only 1,000 nodes or maybe 10,000 nodes and things like that. But my take on that is think about segmentation in terms of your um, functionality. So if you're running batch jobs or your machine learning or AI type of workloads, 
then maybe it's one type of cluster. But again, it depends on your mileage, what you're actually trying to build. So think about your cluster segmentation uh, before you, you, know, you start sizing or thinking about scale. Uh, keep an eye on your scaling events. Generally, scaling up is no issues, but scaling down sometimes, you can look at that config map and it will tell you, no, I didn't scale, scale down because of X, Y, Z. And those are really important. Sometimes these are just non-issue. Now, last but not the least, in terms of scalability, it is well and good. You can define HPAs, cluster auto scalers, VPAs, and all of that. But make sure you stress test or performance test your applications because what you will find is your application scales proper, but your single point of failure is somewhere else. It could be either in your ingress controller or in your cloud's load balancer. And like I've seen this in the past, we were running a cluster on AWS. And when we stress tested our cluster, our applications were OK, but then our ELB in front started dropping packets because that wouldn't scale um, at the rate we, we wanted. Um, and then when we managed to swap it with, I think, ELB or NLB or whatever, uh, we started seeing uh, issues with our Ingress, Nginx, Ingress controller. So make sure you perform this test is just don't rely on who I've created an HPA, it will work. It will work. But your single point of failure might have shifted somewhere else, or your network failure might shift somewhere else. So have a think about those when you're thinking about scalability. Um, security, and I think this is the last bucket of where I want to touch. But from security perspective, and I'll probably make it a bit quick as well, RBAC. I think we talked about RBAC enough, and Adrian touched on it as well. But please do consider RBAC. Very seriously, when you're uh, looking to run a cluster in production, even if you have one singular namespace or one single project, think about least privilege service account. Think about the least privilege principle when you're creating roles and when you're giving access to people. Um, consider rotation of your service account as well. Um, but all in all, key takeaway: look at the RBAC model for your app for your cluster, and make sure you follow the least privilege principle. Um, this another important aspect of security is natively Kubernetes had has many admission controllers, which you should enable if they're not enabled by default. I think most of the cloud providers enable some of them, uh, but not all of them are enabled by default. And if you're running your own self-hosted cluster, make sure these admission controllers are enabled from a security perspective. Uh, pod security policy is really, really important because you want to make sure um, you limit your uh, kernel capabilities for your uh, containers. Um, validating webhooks and mutating webhooks are generally enabled, but if not, make sure they're enabled. Um, this will this will help you if you run something like a gatekeeper and OPA, which I'll touch on very quickly. Um, so yeah, have a crack. Like if you haven't heard about admission controllers, they're pretty much like it is what it says on the team. When you are entering, when you're seeking admission into your Kubernetes cluster, admission controller is the one that runs an evaluation on whatever you're submitting to that cluster. So if there is a controller, a custom written controller, which says, hey, if in this deployment spec, somebody say, if there is a mention of the name Pratik, maybe don't run it because he might be hacking your system. That could be your admission controller. I'm making things up, but you get the point. It is pretty much a thing on the entry of your cluster, which is which can validate and tell you you should be able to allow you should be able to enter or not enter the cluster. Please have a very hard look at these admission controllers if you're serious about security in production. This there will be a lot in this uh, uh, in, in in admission controllers that you can do. Um, network policies uh, secu from security perspective, I think they are very much a requirement. You should absolutely think about network policies. Um, they help you segment traffic, first of all, because by, 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 by default, when you run a Kubernetes cluster, it's all open. Anything can talk to anything living on the cluster, um, and every pod can communicate to every other pod. This might be okay for you, but if, you, if there are requirements that you need to segment or you need to create specific traffic paths that like and when a request comes in, it lands on the ingress pod, then goes to this one specific pod which does some magic and then goes to other ones. Network policies are your uh, helpful tool there. And as you can see on the screen, you can pretty much filter ingress, egress, uh, 
where your traffic goes, where your traffic doesn't. You can do it on pod per pod basis, or you can also do it per namespace basis. Key takeaway, please have a look at network policies. And this is what I'm saying with every slide, but yeah, <laughs> have a look at network policies. Um, and generally speaking, in terms of security, the first one, I, 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 like last time somebody did mention that, why would you even mention that master should be private? Is it not a default? I'm like, no, it's not. For some people, you don't need to have private clusters, right? Um, and again, it depends on what you're trying to build for. But as a rule of thumb, I would say, if the need is not to make it public, and even if it, there is a need to public, consider making your masters private. Exposing your master in the inter on the internet just because a CI tool or CD tool can reach it is not a good um, option. Think about how you can work around it or build around it or build a proper pattern out of it. Um, API logging, I've already said about it. Um, TLS for Kubernetes API, make, yeah, I mean, that's pretty standard. Make sure that happens and use look at using stripped down AMIs from your cloud provider if you're on cloud, like GKE has cost and... Um, AWS has um, optimized AMIs. I don't remember what they're called, but yeah, have a look at those and constantly, regularly patch your uh, nodes. And if you're managing your own Kubernetes, make sure you're keeping up to date with Kubernetes versions. Um, there is definitely a lot of security fixes that get applied. Now, one of the questions I noticed previously was, uh, how do you make sure that your KH is upgraded if you're running a self-hosted version? Um, it really, it really depends on, um, again, it depends, but I would recommend if you have like a multi-cluster setup, like an active-active cluster, make sure you have the capability or you've thought about canaring your cluster changes as well. And if you don't have an active-active setup, maybe at least think about blue-greening your clusters, uh, but you have to be in the habit of making sure you can upgrade um, in place upgrades are good, but sometimes, and I know for a very specific Kubernetes version, in, in place upgrades were not possible for that version. So make sure you think about this kind of strategy, either blue greening or canaring your clusters. Um, now, very quickly, I'll run through three or four OSS tools, which in my experience I found very, very useful. The first one is Gatekeeper OPA. Really, it's if you look at on the right hand side, you can create policies. And again, Gatekeeper is an uh, OPA is an admission controller, and gate, Gatekeeper is more of a uh, wrapper around it. But what it lets you do is, when you're seeking entry, you can write policies in Rego like this on the on right hand side, and deny entry to pods which are not meeting your criteria. <laughs> Have a look at Gatekeeper and OPA um, when it comes to securing your clusters. Um, Container scanning, and I think uh, Adrian touched on this as well. Um, make sure you've thought about in, in, in your production uh, cluster, you are scanning your containers that are deployed on the cluster. Like if a CV is released once you've deployed it, you need to have a way where you can figure out what's vulnerable, what's running on your cluster, and how do you fix it? Do you stop it? Do you not stop it? And there are open, tool, open source tools like Sysdig or Anchor, engine which can do that for you. Um, and also scan your images before you deploy to your cluster. Like one of the one of the things I always recommend is make sure you secure your supply chain. You can secure your cluster, you can do a whole lot with your cluster, but if your supply chain is not secure, if it is pushing out vulnerable things, it doesn't really add much value. Um, second last, is look at some of the open source tooling like KubeBench, KubeHunter. I know Adrian mentioned this as well, but run it against your cluster and see if you're compatible and see if you're uh, still at the same standards. There are some very good open source standards available. Make sure you run these tooling against your cluster. And last one is um, if you have stateful workloads on your cluster and you need to find a solution for volume management, open, have a look at OpenEBS. Open EBS makes working with stateful sets a hell of a lot easier um, than native solution. Um, lastly, as I've been saying, security is everyone's responsibility. Take away um, and think about each of the layer, each layer of your stack. How are you going to protect it? How are you going to operationalize it? How are you going to observe it? And there's a lot of open source tech to help you with that. On that note, thank you very much for your time.